to enter the Department of Mathematics here. It's uh, really a great honor to be invited to give these lectures and a great pleasure to be here in uh, Korea. So uh, the, uh, I spend about half my time nowadays working on solid crystals and half the time working on liquid crystals. So they both have the word crystals in, but they're, they're, a, bit, they're a bit different. So, and, 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 and I find sort of interesting parallels between the two subjects. So. Uh, I think there are things that I've learned or think I've learned from solid mechanics that you can apply to, to liquid crystals. And so, so I thought it might be interesting to, to link these together uh, in, in these uh, lectures. So um, solid crystals then uh, and liquid crystals. So here's a sort of typical picture of a, of a solid crystal, so a regular crystal lattice. Uh, and on the right is a, one kind of liquid crystal. This is a, a smectic uh, liquid crystal. So it's formed of these sort of rod-like molecules that arrange themselves into, into layers. Uh, and this is a so-called smectic A uh, uh, crystal. So there are two uh, pictures of, of, if you like, microstructures, one in a solid crystal, which is it was in steel, and one in smectic liquid crystal, thin films. Okay, just at a superficial level, they don't look all that different. Of course, they are very different. Uh, the, what, th these are not the smectic layers, but they are layers, and inside there are, there are smectic layers, actually. But, but you see that, potentially, anyway, there might be some sort of connection between the mathematics, and of course, the I mean, one, one, one kind of connection is that they have this, a similar sort of variational structure of the multidimensional uh, calculus of variations. So uh, today I'm going to, um, so I'm going to give two lectures on, on, on uh, microstructure in solids, interfaces in solids, and one on, on liquid crystals. And so uh, because the, the, the sort of technical apparatus for the, for the um, uh, solid crystals is uh, a bit more extensive that you need. I, I'm, to, today I'm going to talk about the sort of general theory, so there won't be so much new today, but I need it to, uh, to um, tell you newer things uh, tomorrow. And then, uh, and then uh, in the third lecture tomorrow I'll talk about planar discontinuities in liquid crystals, and they're, they're kinds of defects that are not the usual ones that are are, uh, are considered. Okay, so the general theory of Martin-Sittig uh, phase transformations. Um, so Martin-Sittig transformations, we, we had a very nice lecture, some of, at least some of us had a very nice lecture by Professor Inamura, which described this, so I'm sort of going to repeat a little bit of what he said. So um, Martin-Sittig transformations, they involve a change of shape of the crystal lattice of some alloy at a critical temperature. So, for example, it might be a, a cubic to tetragonal transformation. So you've got a single crystal, which at, uh, so the te theta is going to be the temperature. And so here it is at, a, at, at, a te at the high temperature, so uh, theta bigger than some critical temperature. There's a, there's, a, um, there's a unit cell of the lattice. For example, there might be a, an atom at each corner and in the middle of each face. That would be face-centered cubic. And then you repeat that. Uh, to form a to form a, a large uh, a large lattice. Okay, now you now you, so this high temperature phase is is then so I've I've drawn it now. I will always assume that the high temperature phase is cubic. And a high temperature phase is called typically austenite. And then you reduce the temperature to a temperature below theta critical. And for for energetic reasons. Uh, interactions between the atoms and the electrons and so on, uh, the, the, the material wants to uh, change its shape. And in this case, the change of shape is that the cube uh, forms a tetragon, which is a brick-like object with two sides equal and one side different. So if the one side this difference is, say, longer than the other two, then it, it, it may stretch in this, in this uh, sort of x1 direction, if you like. But because it, uh, the situation has cubic symmetry, if it would like to do this, it would also like to stretch in the two other cubic directions. And so that way you get three so-called 
variants of the low temperature phase, which is called martensite. And of course, they, they, they will be just one, one uh, element of a, of, of, of a new lattice. And this is a this is a first order transformation. So as you so it doesn't happen gradually. I mean, as as you reduce the temperature through theta critical, if you reduce it enough, um, it will suddenly change shape. So it's quite you, know, you can even hear it you know, with a click often. So the change of shape might not be um, cubic to tetragonal. It could be, for example, cubic to orthorhombic. So here we have the elementary cube. And now the change of shape involves, first of all, a stretching in one of the cubic directions, which gives you three possible choices, and then uh, uh, stretches of different amounts in, in the two face diagonals. And so you could swap those two diagonals, so you get uh, two extra choices for each of these three choices. So in the end, you get six possible variants of the orthorhombic uh, phase for uh, theta less than theta critical. So that, for example, takes uh, that kind of transformation occurs in the shape memory alloy, alloy copper, aluminum, nickel. Okay. So here's a high resolution picture which enables you to see this happening uh, at the atomistic level uh, in uh, nickel manganese, which undergoes a cubic to tetragonal uh, transformation. And so this is, this is the low temperature phase. So at the high temperature, there was no, none of this microstructure. It was just a regular crystal lattice. And then you, the experiment is you lower the temperature. And if you look at some part of the specimen, you'll see this, this um, piecewise linear deformation. If you sort of run your eye across from left to right, you see it's linear in each of these uh, layers. And the layers are alternately about six or ten atomic spacings uh, wide. So very, very fine uh, layers. And each, each, um, each dot here represents a column of atoms uh, perpendicular to the screen. Okay, so now if you look, so now the, the cubic axes are into the screen and at 45 degrees to the horizontal. So they're shown here in in purple. Now if you look very carefully at these dots, uh, it will take too long to wait to point them out and there'll be arguments and so on, uh, you'll see that the, the, the picture looks like this. So here's one of the interfaces between these layers and to the right, so this is a face-centered cubic structure, so there's an atom at each corner and in the middle of each face, and you see that to the right is chosen one variant so uh, it's stretched in this cubic direction, and to the left, it's, uh, it's stretched in this cubic direction. Okay, so, it, so the interface separates uh, two different variants of the Martin site. And, and, the, and in fact, the orientation of this interface is chosen so that it sort of fits together nicely at the atomistic level. And so we'll see that reflected in continuum calculations in a moment. So, so that's a sort of typical result of what happens. It's energetically possible for the material to choose different variants in different parts of the specimen, but they have to fit together somehow. Okay. So, uh, of course, you might want to model things atomistically, but that, that's not a practical proposition if you want to understand uh, microstructures like this. So we're almost obliged to use uh, a continuum theory, and the continu continuum theory of choice is elasticity theory, nonlinear elasticity theory. So you can, so I'm going to describe the, the, the way I did this with Dick James now quite a long time ago. So, uh, so we have a single crystal, Usual, usual sort of thing for continuum mechanics, you, you choose a reference configuration which you use to label the material points of the crystal. So that's the reference configuration. So it's some uh, uh, region omega of R3. And now you deform the uh, material. So I'm just going to consider statics, so no time. And uh, the point which was at x in the reference configuration gets mapped to a point y of x in the deformed configuration. Okay, and then 
The idea is that we, 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 we try to find a deformation Y that will minimize the total free energy. So I'm here, I'm, I'm just going to consider the elastic energy, no other ex extra terms like due to gravity or anything like that. And you get that energy by integrating over omega a free energy density which depends on the deformation gradient. So at each point x, this gradient is, so y goes from omega in R3 to R3, so at each point x this is a 3 by 3 matrix, and it also depends on the temperature. You integrate that over, over, over omega, and you get the total uh, free energy. And you'd like to find, you'd like to try to find such a deformation that minimizes this integral subject to some boundary conditions. For example, there might be one part of the boundary which is drawn here in red, d omega 1, and on d omega 1 you might specify what y is to be a given mapping uh, y bar. So in theta is the temperature, of c is the uh, free energy density. Okay, so uh, so what properties should the free energy density have? Well, uh, first of all, a little bit of notation. So throughout, I'm going to write M3 cross 3 for real 3 by 3 matrices. If I put a plus on it, that will mean that the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix is strictly positive. SO3 is the usual notation for rotations. And P24 is the set of rotations, which are, there are 24 of them, uh, which uh, uh, map a cube to itself. Okay. So I'm going to suppose that the free energy density for uh, every temperature theta maps uh, matrices with positive determinant to, um, well, uh, to, to zero infinity. So I'll suppose that it's bounded below, so without loss of generality you can suppose it's bounded below by zero. So C uh, uh, takes um, three by three matrices with positive determinant to zero infinity and that it's say C1. The second condition is frame indifference. This just says that uh, if, I, if I take the body and stretch it, then, then the energy is invariant to rotating the whole body rigidly. So that amounts to uh, pre-multiplying, so multiplying on the left by rotation matrix Q. So for any Q in SO3 and for any A, we require that a C of Q A theta is a C of A theta. And then cubic symmetry, well what this means is that is if I first do a rotation that maps the cube to itself, that won't change anything. So that um, a C of A R theta has got to equal a C of A theta for all R in this symmetry group of the cube, P24, and, uh, and for all A. So I, I assume all these uh, things. So how do we encode the phase transformation at the level of the properties of C and how it varies with the temperature theta? So one way to do this is to look at the set, or one way to learn something about it, is to look at the set of matrices that minimize the free energy density at temperature theta. So I call that set of matrices K of theta. And so we'll assume the following, which looks a bit forbidding at first glance. So, so this is going to be what I'm going to assume about the, the form of K of theta for theta bigger than theta critical, for theta equals theta critical, and theta less than theta critical. So, so the easiest one to understand is the middle one, when theta is equal to theta critical. So, so we, we make a choice of reference configuration. We're going to choose the high temperature phase at the critical temperature to be the reference configuration. Okay, so at the critical temperature, we want the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase to have the same energy. Okay, so, so uh, because we're choosing the reference configuration to be the austenite at the critical temperature, that means that the deformation y of x is equal to x, in other words, do nothing, that should minimize the energy. Its gradient is the identity matrix. So we want the identity matrix to belong to K of theta, uh, at, at theta critical. Okay? But C is invariant to rotations, and so if the identity belongs to K of theta, then uh, any rotation must belong to K of theta 
as well. So this SO3 here represents the energy well, or the bottom of the energy well, corresponding to the austenite at temperature theta critical. Okay, now, what about the low temperature phase? So, that's, that's a, so there's a change of shape. The change of shape is given by um, a finite number, so that capital N is going to denote the number of variants of the low temperature phase. So for each one of them, there's a, there's a, matri a positive definite matrix, UI, that depends on theta. So here it's evaluated at theta critical. So that represents the change of shape. So we want that UI belongs to this set K theta critical. And again, because of frame indifference, we want to be able to pre-multiply by any rotation. So here we get a, a finite number N corresponding to the number of variants of energy wells, each of which is SO3 times a, a positive definite symmetric matrix. So that explains what K of theta critical is. Now when theta is bigger than theta critical, we want the austenite to minimize the energy. So we want SO3 to be the, uh, to be the um, K of theta, but uh, the, there'll be typically some thermal expansion, so we, we multiply uh, SO3 by a, a factor alpha of theta, which is 1 at theta critical. So that's just to represent thermal expansion. But otherwise, this is the energy well, or this represents the energy well corresponding to the high temperature phase, the austenite, which we want to have less energy for theta uh, bigger than theta critical. And for theta less than theta critical, we want the, the martensite energy wells to have give less energy. So we want, we want, we want them to be in, in, in K theta. So again, the, the UI, uh, UIs depend on theta. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to uh, assume about the, um, uh, the, the, the set uh, K of theta. So we see it's got quite a complicated um, uh, zero set, this, this function. Now, the, the ui of theta, suppose you're given one of them, so say u1 of theta, then you get the others by uh, taking any rotation in P24 and calculating R u1 R transposed. Okay, so, so some of those will be equal. So you won't, you won't in general get 24 distinct matrices. You will get some number that divides 24, actually. Uh, so in the case of cubic to tetragonal, you just get three. In the case of cubic to orth orthorhombic, you'll get uh, uh, six. So for cubic to tetragonal, then, n would be three, and the three matrices would have this form. So u1 is diagonal a to 2, a to 1, a to 1. So these are the, the amounts you stretch the cube by, the factors you stretch the cube by. So these, these are, um, will, will depend on, on, on theta, uh, typically. And, the, and U2 you get by just permuting, so the A to 2 is in the second entry, and U3 so that it's in the, in the third entry. And for a cubic to orthorhombic, you have uh, N is equal to 6, and in this case you have three parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, that uh, uh, give you the change of shape, and these are the six matrices, if you work it out. Okay. Now, we saw in, we saw in the, in the, in the in, in the high resolution picture, these interfaces. So how do we describe interfaces at the, at the level of the continuum theory? Well, suppose you've got a piecewise affine map, so it's continuous and its gradient jumps across a plane. So the plane has normal capital N, so it's, it's, the equation is x dot n equals k, say, and above the plane, the gradient is this matrix A, and below the plane, it's the matrix B, and A is different from B, there really is a jump. Okay? So how do we calculate how A is related to B? So this is a, a trivial calculation, but nevertheless it's, for, it's so important in this theory that it's worth, worth doing, and anyway, it's only two lines. So for example, you can let C is A minus B, A minus B, then, then, then uh, you can just equate the tangential derivatives on either side. So you have that Cx is zero if x dot n is zero, but a typical vector such that x dot n is zero is z minus z dot n n for n is z, and therefore you see that Cz is, is, is the matrix Cn tensor producted with n acting on z. 
So that means that C is equal to Cn tensor N. So it tells you that C, which is A minus B, is a vector tensor producted with N. Okay, so this vector is, of course, A minus B acting on N, but usually we don't write that down because it follows immediately. And this is the Hadamard jump condition. So, so uh, what's imp well, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a necessary condition for for having such a jump, and then the N gives you the normal to the interface. That's the important thing. So this this works more generally if y was say piecewise c1 with uh, the gradient of y jumping across a c1 surface. You take a point x at which the normal is n. You have a limit of the gradient from above, uh, which we call a, and from below, which we call b. And again, you get a minus b is a tensor n. And you could prove that, for example, by blowing up around x0 using this formula, which doesn't change the gradient, but as epsilon goes to 0, it flattens the boundary and it reduces it to the previous case. Okay. And uh, later I'll talk about generalizations of this when y is not piecewise uh, c1. So by the jump condition, interfaces will correspond to matrices A and B with A minus B is A tensor N. N will give you the normal. And so at minimum energy, we're going to want A and B to belong to this set K of theta. Okay. So now for the, from the form of K of theta, which is a bunch of, of, of sets, of, it's a union of sets of the form SO3 times some positive definite symmetric matrix, that means that we want to know the, uh, the rank 1 connections between two given energy wells, SO3U and SO3V. So, so I'm going to draw SO3 times something by a circle. Of course, it's not that at all, but, it, but, it, but it's just to, to illustrate things. And the straight lines will represent rank 1 connections. So what we want is to, here's SO3U, here's SO3V. We want to find a matrix... A on SO3U and a matrix B on SO3B such that its difference is a, mat is, is a matrix A tensor N. Okay. So when can you do that? When can you do this? That's the question. So here's a, here's a version due to Carson Carsonson and myself of a standard result. There are lots of things which are sort of equivalent to this, but this is a kind of convenient way of uh, stating it. So so we, ha we have uh, two positive definite symmetric matrices, U and V. Then, then SO3U and SO3V are rank 1 connected. That means you can find one matrix on one well and one on the other, which differ by a matrix of rank 1, if and only if U squared minus V squared can be written as a non-zero constant times M tensor N plus N tensor M, where M and N are unit vectors. So that's the answer. And if M is not parallel to N, and you take one uh, matrix on one of the wells, say V, without loss of generality, you can take it to be V, because otherwise you can just pre-multiply everything by some rotation, then there'll be exactly two matrices on SO3U that are rank 1 connected to it, so there'll be sort of R U and R tilde U for different rotations. And the, and, the, um, and the rank one connection, the normal, the two normals are exactly the two uh, vectors that appear in this representation. Okay, so I won't prove this, but I'm going to, I'm going to read off and prove various consequences from it, which are critical for understanding Martin Cytic phase transformation. So the first one is going to be uh, what, I mean, can you find, uh, can you find a pair of matrices on the same energy well, which are rank one uh, connected? So that will correspond to taking U is equal to V. But in that case, U squared is equal to, to V squared, so U squared minus V squared is zero, which is impossible because the theorem tells you that C is non-zero. So that's the first remark, that there are no rank 1 connections between matrices A belonging to the same energy well. Okay. So the next thing is to look at two different Martensitic variants. So I'm going to look at SO3UI and SO3UJ. 
And I claim that the theorem tells you that these are rank 1 connected if and only if the determinant of ui squared minus uj squared is 0, and then that the possible interface normals are orthogonal. And so these, so variants separated by such interfaces are called twins. So that's what we saw in the, in the high resolution picture. These interfaces are twin, the, the, the variants on either side are twin related, we say. Okay, so why, why is this? Well, first of all, if they're rank one connected, then you must have, so ui squared minus ui squared is a, is, 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 has rank at most two, because it's the sum of two uh, tensor products. So, um, so, for example, you can hit the equation by uh, some vector that is perpendicular to m and n, and you'll get zero. Right? So that means that uh, uh, ui squared minus uj squared has a zero eigenvalue, i.e. that the determinant is zero. So that's clearly a necessary condition. So now suppose that uh, the determinant of ui squared minus uj squared is zero. Well, then you can, you can write uij squared minus uj squared. It has a, has a spectral decomposition with eigenvalues, but one of them is zero. Okay, so one term isn't there, so it's lambda e tensor e plus mu e hat tensor e hat, where e and e hat are, are orthogonal. Now, because they're Martin-Siddick variants, they are con they're conjugate uh, with respect to uh, uh, rotation, so u uj is r ui r transposed for some uh, rotation in P24. And that means that the trace of ui squared minus uj squared has to be zero. So taking the trace here, you see that lambda plus mu is zero. So actually, uij squared minus uj squared has this form, and you can write it, uh, you can just play around and you write it in the form lambda something, ten, so an m tensor n plus n tensor m as required. Okay. So that's how you, how you do that. Now, uh, it's amusing that uh, there's another equivalent condition uh, due to Alain Fourclat, who was a former student, now a banker or something, uh, uh, which is that the determinant of ui minus uj is zero. So now, it's very tempting to say that uij squared minus uj squared is ui minus uj times ui plus uj, but that's not true because ui and uj are matrices and they don't commute in general, right? However, in three dimensions, a, there is a very interesting formula that, that, that tells you, which is here, which tells you that in fact one vanishes if and only if the other vanishes. Okay, so that's what he discovered. So if you apply this to a cubic tetragonal transformation, you find that the possible twin planes are those in the 110 family. So these three possible, these are typical um, 110 planes, and that's what we saw actually in the high resolution picture because the, the plane was vertical and it, and it bisected the, the, uh, the cubic ax axis. So, um, so that seems everything's satisfactory. Okay, now the third, uh, the third um, thing to read off is that uh, there is a rank one connection between SO3, so that would be the austenite energy well, and SO3 UI, if and only if UI has middle eigenvalue 1. Now you would not expect, so I, I'll prove this in a second, but you would not expect UI to have an eigenvalue 1. That's a very non-generic uh, thing to happen. But if, you, but if you very carefully make a material for which the middle eigenvalue of UI is equal to 1, then very spectacular things happen. We saw that in Inamura's talk, and we'll see it in, in Shen, Chen's talk tomorrow. And, and, it's, and, it, and, and doing this sort of thing has led to, this, to the discovery of amazing new materials, re really discovered by mathematics. It's a, it's a great sort of good story for, for mathematics. Anyway, why, why, is this, why is this true? Well, if there's a rank one connection, uh, then... Uh, then one is an eigenvalue because um, uh, if there's a rank one connection, we have this representation formula from the, uh, from, the, from the theorem, so the determinant of ui squared minus the identity would be zero, which says that one is an eigenvalue. Why is it the middle eigenvalue? Well, um, if m is not parallel to n, then you can, you can, you can find vectors e 
uh, which, which make m dot e and n dot e say positive, and then you can, then you can uh, calculate ui squared minus identity e dotted with e, and so that will make that, will make, uh, that expression have one sign, and you can also uh, make one positive and one negative, which you get, so you get the other sign. So that, so that by the sort of variational characterization of eigenvalues will tell you that, that one has to be the middle eigenvalue. And, it, and if m, m is parallel to plus or minus n, then the eigenvalue has multiplicity two, and so again it's a middle eigenvalue. If one is the middle eigenvalue, then you can write ui squared minus the identity in terms of the spectral uh, decomposition. So the E2 tends to E2 term will cancel because one is the eigenvalue, and then you, you can rewrite this in the in the form in the in the theorem, thereby saying that you have a rank one connection. Okay, now so the existence of these twins, well, it, assuming that determinant u i squared minus u j squared is is zero, so you, you'll get twins. So, so sometimes you get, sometimes the determinant is zero, and sometimes it isn't. I mean, you can have several different variants, and certain pairs may be, uh, certain certain of the energy wells may be uh, rank one connected, and certain other ones may not be. For example, so this is a real condition that you've got to you've got to check. So in the cubic to tetragonal case, they were, every pair was rank one uh, connected. So this implies, the existence of twins implies that the free energy density is not rank one convex. That is, if you look in the direction uh, of a matrix, a matrix of rank one along that line, and you look and see what, what um, a C is, it's not a convex function. Why, why is that? Well, here's the sort of picture. That's, here's the... Here's two, um, two energy wells, and, and, here's, and here's, the, here's one energy well, here's the other energy well. Here's the rank one connection, which connects this point to this point. But, this, so, but if, you look, if you look on at, at, uh, at the energy on this line, it's got to be zero here and zero here, and positive everywhere else. So it can't be convex. Okay, so the existence of twins means that a C is not uh, a rank one uh, convex. Now, rank one convexity is a necessary condition for something else, which is called quasi-convexity, which I'll attempt to explain in a second. Now, quasi-convexity is the central convexity condition of the multidimensional calculus of variations, and lying only a little it is necessary and sufficient for the existence of minimizers. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to minimize uh, I theta of Y, which is our, our elastic energy, subject to given boundary conditions, it's more or less necessary and sufficient that a C satisfies this so-called quasi-convexity condition. And for example, in elasticity theory, you can, you can find um, abscies that very nicely represent rubber, and they are quasi-convex, and there is a, there is a minimizer uh, for, such, for such materials. So that means that we expect that the minimum of the energy is in general not attained. So I said, well, we wanted to minimize this integral, and now I'm telling you, well, actually, you're not going to succeed in general, because there won't be a, uh, a, a, a deformation y that minimizes the energy. The energy is bounded below, that's not the problem, but there won't be a minimizer. And what will happen, what we expect to happen is that if you take a minimizing sequence of deformations yj, then their gradients will start oscillating at, fine, at finer and finer length scales. They will converge to something that is not a minimizer, because there isn't a minimizer, actually. Okay. Okay, so they will, they will, so what we expect is that minimizing sequences in general will generate infinitely fine microstructures. And indeed, you often see very fine microstructures. We saw one which was incredibly fine, just six or ten atomic spacings wide. Here's another one in, in, in nickel 65 aluminum 35. I'll talk about this particular picture uh, later on. And um, so here you see one family again of of layers and another one which meet in some sort of interesting uh, sort of interface. Of course, it's not infinitely fine, right? But um, 
So, in fact, there's a length scale to these microstructures, and, and the conventional way of understanding that length scale is, is that it is set by the balance between elastic energy in certain parts of the, uh, of the, of the crystal and the interfacial energy of twin boundaries. So, actually, the, atomistic the, 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 the atomic environment of, a, of an atom which is sitting very close to this interface is different from one sitting in the middle of a, of, a, of a layer. So we expect to have a little piece, a little change in energy actually on the interface here. Okay, so that's ignored. So it must be very small, otherwise you wouldn't see such fine, um, so, such large amounts of, uh, of interface. But it is nevertheless there, and, and, it, and it's that that sends, sets the length scale. And it's, and, it, and it's ignored in this model that I've described um, so far. So if you like, a good thing about this model is that it, through, this, through the fact that uh, the minimum is not attained, it, it gives you a reason for why you see these incredibly fine microstructures. That in, the, in this model, which admittedly ignores interfacial energy, which is, which is very small, you expect that minimizing sequence generate infinitely fine microstructure. So there's a mechanism there. So somehow the, the fact that you, it's interesting philosophically, the fact that you can't solve the problem, that you can't find a minimizer, actually predicts something that you, that you see. Okay. Okay, now what's this condition? Quasi-convexity. So it was it was introduced by Mori in, in 1952. So it's 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 a general condition working in any dimension. So let me so let me just state it in any dimension. So now I'm going to take an omega which is in R n and it's some bounded open set with some reasonable boundary, and I'm going to look at maps that take omega to a different dimensional space R m. So in our case, m and n are both three. Okay, so that means that the gradient of such a mapping will, at a typical point, will be an m by n matrix. So let's suppose I've got a, a non-negative function defined on m by n matrices. I'll even allow it to take the value plus infinity. That's that's quite useful. And uh, and suppose it's it's continuous with the obvious sort of topology on this extent half extended real line. So now, the function W is said to be quasi-convex at a particular matrix A if, when you integrate over omega, W of A plus the gradient of phi of x dx, and phi is in W0, 1 infinity, so that means it's Lipschitz maps uh, um, which uh, vanish on the boundary of omega, then that integral is bigger than or equal to what you get by putting phi is equal to zero, which is just w of a. So on the right hand side you're integrating a constant. It's just the, the measure of omega times uh, w of a. Okay. That's what it means for uh, uh, w to be quasi-convex at this matrix A, and it's quasi-convex if it's quasi-convex at every matrix A. Well, that's not, very, not a very nice definition when you look at it the first time or even the hundredth time. Uh, so first of all, so, how do, so A plus the gradient of phi of x is the gradient of this map Z, AX plus phi of x. Okay. So what, this, what, the, what it says is, it's, it's kind of Jensen's inequality for gradients. So it says that uh, if, you, if you seek to minimize the integral of W of DZ of x, subject to z being ax on the boundary, then a minimizer is given by the linear boundary data z identically equal to ax, because that's what you've got on the right-hand side. Okay. Well, one of the first things that's irritating about this definition is that it's supposed to be something to do with w and a, but there's an omega in it. Well, that's a bit funny, but Okay, but it turns out that the definition is independent of omega. Okay, so there's this calculation that shows it's independent of omega. So if it's true for one omega, it's true for any, any omega. If you don't like 
this space you could take smooth functions of compact support it's more or less the same same definition so there's various different ways you can write down the definition here's an, here's another one so uh, it's a, for finite continuous uh, w it's the same as saying that uh, the average of w of the gradient of y over the cube is bigger than or equal to w of a whenever uh, you've got a, a Lipschitz or smooth y from rn to rm whose gradient is q periodic it's 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 uh, it's so 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 um, it's the, dy is the restriction to a cube q of a q periodic map on on rn and that the average of uh, of the gradient of, of this y over the over the cube is a. Okay, so in, the, in this in this version of the definition, you're not fixing the boundary data to be linear. It suffices that the average of the gradient gives you gives you a. And you can you could do that. You wouldn't have to have a cube. You could have anything that would tile R n, and you could do the same sort of thing. You could even have a replaced periodicity with almost periodicity. So there's all sorts of different ways of um, expressing this condition, but in, in the end you have some kind of Jensen's inequality for gradients, and the question is how on earth would you decide whether a function satisfies this condition or not? And the answer is we don't know how to do it, actually, which is worrying. What do we know? Well, we know a lot of things, but we don't know that. So there's another, there's another condition called polyconvexity, which says, which, which, so W is, is polyconvex if um, uh, you can write it as a convex function of the list of all minors of the matrix A. So minors are subdeterminants of the matrix. Okay? So you write down all the subdeterminants of A in, in, or, in some order, and if W is a convex function of that list of minors, uh, then um, uh, it's called polyconvex. So if both dimensions are three, which is what we're usually doing, then what, are, what do we have? We've got one by one minors that form the matrix A, we've got two by two minors that form the cofactor matrix A, and we've got one three by three minor, namely the determinant of A. So we've got, in fact, nine plus nine plus one, 19 variables here. If you can write W as a convex function of those 19 variables, then it's polyconvex. And what we know is that convexity, of course, implies polyconvexity. So polyconvexity implies quasi-convexity. So this is quite a short calculation, but I don't, but I don't give it. And quasi-convexity, as I stated, implies rank one convexity. Okay. So that's more or less all we know. And the reverse implications are all true if m or n is one. So, so this is nothing but convexity if, if m or n is 1. And they're all false if m is bigger than 1 and n is bigger than 1, with one exception, which is uh, a, uh, a missing part of our knowledge. We don't know whether rank 1 convexity implies quasi-convexity if m, that's the dimension of the range, is 2. So... Uh, so that's, that's what we know, uh, and um, uh, there are counterexamples. So there's, uh, well, to, you could take just the determinant, which is a, not a convex function of the matrix, so that tells you that polyconvexity does not imply, quasi uh, does not imply convexity. For quasi-convexity not implying polyconvexity, there's, a, there's an example uh, due to Zhang K. Wei, and I think most of the examples, in fact, maybe all the examples of that, use some kind of quasi-convexification, which I'll explain in, 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 in a second what quasi-convexification is. And this, uh, that, uh, that rank one convexity does not imply quasi-convexity, was a long-standing open problem for about 50 years, which was solved by uh, Vladimir Shverak. Okay. So is the retractable characterization of quasi-convexity? So this is the main roadblock of the subject, and it has real implications for understanding microstructure. So the fact that we don't, we, we can't, we don't know how to solve this problem and tell whether a given function is quasi-convex or not stops us from analyzing different microstructures in the way that we would 
like to. And this is a, a result which is really wor you know, worrying when you start looking for such a characterization. So uh, for the same dimensions as spherex counterexample works for, namely m bigger equal to 3 and n bigger equal to 2, there's no local condition equivalent to quasi-convexity. For example, you can't find a bunch of inequalities on W and its first 10 billion derivatives at, a, at an arbitrary matrix A, which is necessary and sufficient for W to be quasi-convex. So if there is a characterization, it's not a local characterization. Now, a very useful tool, which is surprisingly related to quasi-convexity, as I'll explain in a second, for describing microstructures are gradient Young measures. So how do we, how do we, what's a gradient Young measure? So you get one, you get a gradient Young measure corresponding to a given sequence of gradients. So say gradient of, of yj, so you could think of this as being a minimizing sequence for the energy, but it could be any, any, any sequence. So, so given a sequence of gradients, gradient yj, I'm going to try and explain to you what the Young measure is. So, so we, we, take a, we, take a, we, we behave as if we we're a microscopist. So we take a point x and we look in some small ball b with radius delta centered at x. I take some subset E of m by n matrices and I, I look at the probability distribution uh, corresponding to taking a point at random from this little ball and seeing what the value of dy, j is. So I'm fixing j, I'm fixing x, and I'm fixing delta. But I pick points at random from this ball and I, f and I, I would like to know, so what's the probability that I get a value lying in the set E when I do that. Well, that's, the, that's the, the volume of the set of points in the ball, such that the gradient lies in E, divided by the volume of the ball. Okay? So, um, so, uh, so that gives you a probability measure on matrices parameterized by x, j, and delta. Okay, then. You first of all let j go to infinity. So if, if this is oscillating faster and faster with j, say, those oscillations will be smeared out across this ball. And then you let delta go to zero. So that localizes things at, 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 at x. And so if you're lucky, then you'll get something which is now a probability distribution on matrices that depends only on x. Okay. And in fact, well, given almost any, given any bound on this sequence, it's always possible to extract a subsequence of this sequence of gradients such that this double limit exists. And it gives you a, uh, a, a, a measure on matrices, a family of, of probability measures on matrices parameterized by the point X. And that's called the gradient Young measure generated by the sequence d, y, j, assuming you've already extracted this, uh, this uh, subsequence. So that's just really an object about calculus, right? I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no energy minimization or anything else mentioned there. This is just about gradients of things, right? But there's a remarkable connection with uh, minimization, which was found by Kindelira and Pedregal. So, so a family of probability measures on matrices, depending measurably on x, is the Young measure corresponding to a, a, a sequence of gradients bounded in L infinity, if and only if, first of all, the, its center of mass, so say it's a center of mass, uh, is a gradient, and that will be the weak limit of d, dyj. And secondly, the Jensen's inequality holds for every quasi-convex f. So, so nu x of f, that's the expectation of f under nu x, so that's given by integrating f against the measure. So this has to hold for almost every x. Right? So is bigger than or equal to f of the center of mass of the measure. 
So, um, so this shows you that you know, calculus at the, at the you know, this kind of micro-geometry, quasi-convexity is deeply implicated in this, uh, in this business. So how does that work uh, for a simple laminate? So here's, here's, a, here's a, suppose we take uh, two matrices that are rank one connected, so their difference is A tensor N, that means I can, I can layer them a, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, with the normal to the interfaces being N. Okay. So now let's, let's suppose that we, we construct a sequence of gradients, D, Y, J, which takes these values A, B alternately, and the A layers are of thickness lambda over J, and the B layers are of thickness 1 minus lambda over J. And now I let J go to infinity. So as J goes to infinity, this becomes infinitely fine. Okay, so first of all, you could try and understand that at the level of the weak or weak star limit of dyj. So the weak star limit is, is a gradient, which is in this case a constant, and it's just given by the average uh, gradient, which is just lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b. Okay. Now the, the young measure corresponding to this is does not depend on x, okay, and it says it's lambda of direct mass at a plus 1 minus lambda of direct mass at b. That says that you've got a probability lambda of seeing the mat of finding the matrix A, 1 minus lambda finding the matrix B, and 0 of finding any other matrix, okay. So that's consistent with the way I described the, um, the construction of the young measure. And then the, uh, the, w the weak limit is given by the center of mass of the of the young measure, as, 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 as it has to be. All right, so I told you about quasi-convexity. Now you can, so we're used to, in, in, in convex analysis, taking a function and convexifying it, or taking a set and convexifying the set. Well, you can do the same thing with convexity replaced by quasi-convexity. Right? So, so first of all, for functions, suppose you've got a W, which is not necessarily quasi-convex, then you can take the sup of all quasi-convex functions that are less than that uh, W, and that, that we call WQC. So that's the quasi-convexification of, of, of W. And then for sets, you can, you can define a set of matrices to be um, uh, quasi-convex if it's the zero set of a non-negative quasi-convex function. Okay, now suppose you've got a compact set of matrices K, for example, a bunch of energy wells, then you can quasi-convexify it in the following way. You can, so this is called KQC, you could take the intersection of all the quasi-convex uh, uh, sets that include it. So equivalently, it's the set of the centers of masses of gradient young measures that don't depend on X and have support in K. Or another equivalent version, which is very useful, is, is the set of matrices A such that phi of A is less than or equal to the maximum of phi over K for all quasi-convex uh, phi. Now, the interpretation you should say of, of CQC of A is the macroscopic free energy function corresponding to of C. So if, if, you, if you're imagining getting very fine microstructures, but you're looking at a length scale where you don't see all these oscillations. So then your, the gradient you have is now some weak limit of the gradient. Now what's the, what's the macroscopic energy function that you should use? Well, it should be the quasi-convexification of your Ops. And we know that our Ops is not quasi-convex. So this is a different, a different function. And K of theta QC is the set of macroscopic deformation gradients corresponding to zero energy microstructures. Okay. So now some general uh, uh, considerations. I seem to be going quite slowly here. Or I've got five, five, so I got three or four minutes. Or something. Yeah, yeah, but you, okay. Okay, so um, the microstructures arising from martensitic transformations are driven by compatibility of gradients. Okay? Now, in, in, in order for the transformation to take place, the product phases have to fit 
geometrically onto the parent phase and with one another, right? Ge and, th and that generates a certain microgeometry that is partially uh, captured by gradient young measures. Now, if the product phase can't fit geometrically onto the parent phase, then the parent phase will become metastable. Okay. Now, in trying to understand why we see some microstructures and not others, we're going to use methods based on energy minimization. On the other hand, the formation of microstructures is a pattern formation problem. Okay, so there's no microstructure to start with. You do something, and then you've got a microstructure. So that, that, that should be treated using some dynamical model. And that, and that model should tell us what morphological features are predictable, say using invariant manifolds or attractors or something, in, an, in a given experiment, and, and predict them. However, unfortunately, it's not clear what the appropriate dynamical equations are. And even if you chose one of the possibilities, it's, it's way beyond our capabilities to analyze theoretically or even numerically, because it's a hugely computational in, in, in intensive problem. And, and the static theories are not truly predictive, uh, first, because there's a large redundancy in energy minimizers, and second, because the microstructure geometry is typically assumed a priori and shown to be consistent with the theory rather than saying why you get that uh, particular microstructure. So you may get interesting details. So I just, I'll just end by uh, showing you uh, the classic case of this, which is the classical austenite martensite interface. So this is how, actually, usually, martensite transforms to, to, aust to austenite transforms to martensite. So over here, we've got the austenite, and here we've got the martensite. Now, you see that, you remember that Usually, so this is not a, a middle eigenvalue equals one material. This is a normal kind of material. And, and, we, and remember that the, that, the, that the theorem told us that we can't rank one connect a variant of martensite to the austenite. So, so the, he, over here we've got a simple laminate of the, of the, of the, of the martensite. And uh, so, no, so it alternates between two values, and neither of them is rank one connected to this. So the material does the next simplest thing possible. It forms this very fine laminate, which on average is compatible with the austenite. And so here you can mathematize that. You can, you can think that you've got a, a, a sequence dyj, say a minimizing sequence, that's a simple laminate over here, alternating between A and B. So A and B would be twins sitting on the, on the different energy wells. And over here is the identity. But there has to be some kind of interpolation layer because A and B are not compatible uh, with the identity. So at the level of young measures, uh, you've got a direct mass at the identity over here and lambda direct mass at A plus 1 minus lambda direct mass B here. At the level of weak limits, you've got the identity matrix over here and lambda A plus 1 minus lambda B over here. And actually, what you've got to check is that you can make this compatible with the identity. So this minus this is a matrix of rank 1. And if you do that, you, you, you lead onto these very famous formulae, the crystallographic theory of martensite, which tell you, for example, that there are 24 habit planes for a cubic to tetragonal uh, transformation. And these are the rank one connections which, which correspond to that. So this is, the, this is for cubic to tetragonal. So here's the austenite energy well. Here are the three tetragonal ones. So first of all, you've got to find uh, a, a pair of twins to make the laminate. So that involves you finding rotations here. And then you've got to find a nice volume fraction such that the identity is rank one connected to that uh, midpoint there. Okay, so it's a, it's a really nasty calculation. So if you just do it without knowing tricks, you'll spend days doing it. But with some tricks, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, too bad. And here's the answer in terms of uh, the lattice parameters A to 1 and A to 2. If you're in this shaded region, you can do it. And if you're not, uh, uh, you can't. Okay. So uh, this is, the, this is the, um, the, 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 the classic case of the austenite martensite interface, and, and you know it predicts. It predicts. It's, it's really successful theory. It predicts the, the 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 normals to the habit planes, the the volume fractions, the angles between the twins and the habit planes. It's it, it's really great, but 
it assumes the answer in some sense. It, you know, you, you look at what you see in an experiment and you say, well, I can construct something which is consistent with that and that's really great. But, uh, but it doesn't tell you why, um, why you might have that uh, kind of microstructure. So next time I'll begin by, by, by sort of asking the question is, you know, whether you might have other microstructures that were compatible with the austenite. With it. And so, so there's some interesting recent uh, experiments on that which I'd like to tell you about. Okay, so that's all for today. <coughs>